Hey, Johnny here, and today I'm building something that most woodworkers hate building, mainly because it's one of the more difficult projects woodworkers tackle, but at the same time, making money building these is almost impossible, even though it's something that every single home needs. So what exactly is the most hated of all woodworking projects? Chairs. So if you recall, a few months ago, I built a Kamiko table, and once that sells, I'll donate the proceeds to charity in my wife's name. And a lot of you told me that I was a shitty person for this, that this was a terrible Christmas gift for my wife, and basically I'm human garbage for thinking that this was even a nice gesture. But what those folks failed to realize is that my wife is actually a good person, and she loved the gesture, but she's also married to a woodworker that can build her a table anytime. So I'm gonna build her her own version of that Kamiko table, but before I do that, I wanted to redeem myself on the gift that I actually gave her, and that was the steel chair that went with that table. That chair is okay, but being steel, it is a bit heavy, so I wanna make something completely out of wood. And this chair is essentially gonna be the head of the table chair for that dining set once I build it. So far, I've been milling up all the lumber that I'm using for this chair build, and if chairs weren't difficult enough, I'm gonna add some extra difficulty by trying steam bending again. Last time I did it, it was a total disaster, but I really wanna figure it out, so I'm trying it again. I wanted to build this chair out of ash, but my lumber supplier didn't have any, so I'll be using the old standby, red oak, which is currently running about a quarter of the cost of white oak or walnut. And I think the main reason why my past attempts at steam bending didn't go so well is that I tried to bend kiln-dried walnut that was almost an inch thick. So this time I'm gonna cut every piece to an eighth of an inch strip, which does a few things. One, it makes steam bending easier given how flexible the wood is under normal conditions when it's cut that thin. And two, it allows me to create a really interesting finger joint using those bent wood strips. While I assemble the steam bending templates, I wanna take a second and explain the design of this chair. While researching chairs, I came across this beautiful piece by Sam Wong Lee, who's a very talented furniture designer in South Korea. It features steam bent wood combined with finger jointed wood strips. And while I don't wanna make an exact copy of this chair, it is heavily gonna be the inspiration for my design, but I also added a few touches to make it my own thing. So recently we moved and the dining room of the new place is a bit smaller than the old house, meaning that eight foot glass river table that I built for my wife a few years ago no longer fits. So like I mentioned, Katie gets her own Kamiko table and that's gonna be the next video dropping in a couple weeks. But for now I'm focused on one of the chairs and if this goes well, I can batch out a whole set. And if it doesn't go well, then I'll just buy her a set to go with the table, which honestly is probably cheaper than building them. There's a little saying in the woodworking community, why buy something when you can build it for three times as much? I built two identical jigs for the steam bending since there's two sections that need to be bent. And one is for the backrest and the other curve is for the frame of the chair that supports the seat pan. And the idea is to layer up the strips to make a thicker piece and given how thin they are, it should be much more susceptible to bending coming out of the steam chamber. Here we go. I picked up some of these heavy duty 1,270 millimeter Irwin squeeze clamps to pull the forms together. And for all my American viewers, these are 50 inch clamps. And these worked great for this purpose. And so far, these bends are going really well. Way better than my last attempt. And this is really sort of easy. Almost a little too easy actually, although my forearms were getting a bit of a workout. On the second steam bending attempt, I realized I could bend the strips all the way around the form first, and then come back and add some clamps around the bottom to hold those sides in place, and then pull in that lower form, which then saves me from having to pump those squeeze clamps so far. Now, I teased at the beginning of the video that chairs suck to build, and there's a whole list of reasons why, but the main issue for me is that good looking chairs are often difficult and time consuming to build. And I think I spent over a week and a half building this chair, although it would have gone a lot faster if I wasn't filming every step. Nevertheless, chairs usually take a long time to build and you're not likely to find a customer who's willing to spend a thousand bucks or more per chair, which given the time and the complexity is what they're really worth, unless you're just making something super basic. And I know that I'm not the only one who hates building chairs. So I reached out to a couple of my woodworking friends here on YouTube to give their thoughts. 
And first up is my buddy, John Malecki, who's going to give you a very detailed and drawn out explanation as to why he doesn't like building chairs. Uh, chairs suck. Well, that was a bit more succinct than what I would have liked, but he's not wrong. So everything I've read says that you're supposed to wait 24 hours, but it's only been what, about 20, 19? Those bent laminations went really, really well. I know for a fact that when I take this out of the mold, it is gonna spring back on me a little bit. Um, that's to be expected. I think we're gonna be okay getting this glued up and back in the mold. Jinx isn't real, but I hope I'm not jinxing myself because Jinx is very real. That inner form was sort of tough to get out, but otherwise this is looking great. It even had way less spring back than I was anticipating. And right away, I'm gonna put it back in the form to mark my glue line and the new center line. And now the strips have all taken the curve of the form and it's really easy just to pop them back into the jig. I marked the lines on the side of the piece as a reference line so I don't glue past that spot. And leaving the open ends unglued is what's gonna allow me to do the finger joints in the next step. Now, most of the time I use tight bond glue, but anytime I wanna ensure the glue squeeze out isn't super yellow, I use Gorilla Wood Glue. And I'm not sponsored by any glue company, both are fine, but I really like how clear the Gorilla Wood Glue dries. And while I struggle with this chair, I wanna talk about something else that I've been struggling with. And that's my struggle to get back to living healthy again. I mean, I just had a baby, so rocking a dad bod feels somewhat appropriate, but I am trying to get back in shape. And with me, it starts by making some healthy decisions. And that brings me to AG1, the sponsor of today's video. About a month ago, I started drinking AG1 as part of my morning ritual. And with my extra busy schedule and having a new baby and running this business, AG1 is the best way that I've found to support my foundational nutrition by doing a few things. One, with its daily dose of vitamin C and zinc, AG1 helps support my overall immune health. Two, AG1 packs a broad spectrum of micronutrients to keep my body nourished all day long. Three, AG1 contains magnesium and B vitamins to help with sustained energy throughout my day without the caffeine crash that you get from drinking coffee. And four, AG1 supports healthy aging. It doesn't make my gray hairs go away, but it does lay the foundation to support my brain health, my gut health, my immune health. And so by making that daily choice to drink AG1, this good decision leads to other good decisions. I started running and walking again, well, as much as my knees will allow. I focused on eating better. And throughout all these healthy choices, I've managed to drop a couple pounds. So if you're looking to start making some good decisions for your health with AG1 75 vitamins and nutrients and whole food sourced ingredients, go to drinkag1.com slash johnnybuilds or scan the QR code that you see on your screen to get your free welcome kit that includes the canister, the shaker, a year supply of vitamin D3 and K2, plus five extra travel packs of AG1. Thanks to AG1 for sponsoring this video. So far, I know what I want this chair to look like, but I haven't figured out how I'm gonna put it all together. I mean, I had a loose idea, but at this point, I'm just winging it. And the challenge with gluing up these curves is spacing the upper and lower curves correctly while slotting in the finger jointed strips that create the front legs. So this is what I came up with. It's basically a large jig with a lower platform the legs reference off of, and then plywood uprights with spacers that hold the curves and set them each at the proper height and keep them parallel to the floor. Not very elegant looking, but it gets the job done, which now that I think about it, should be my slogan. Maybe I'll put it on a t-shirt, who knows. On each side, I'll slot in seven strips and these get a 90 degree angle cut at the bottom edge. All right, so I got the jig all put together and despite kind of winging it on this, it's actually working really, really well. And now I've got to figure out how to glue up the legs, which are these slats cut with that nine degree angle. I got to figure out how to glue these legs through both of these. I'm a little worried that it's not going to be that easy. Uh, I have to put glue in very specific places and I don't want a lot of squeeze out because it's going to make it look bad. I'm rambling and I'm avoiding the thing that I know is gonna be difficult and I know I have to do it and there's nothing else to do but to do it and I don't want to. 
<laughs> I want to stay right here where everything's nice and safe. That being said, let's do it. I often fret over a particular part of a build only to have that thing end up being really easy and such was the case here. Initially, I was just gonna do a dry fit to make sure everything was lining up correctly, but I realized that I could use that dry fit to mark my glue line because these slats are gonna come apart to spread open for the finger jointed sections and I don't want visible glue residue in those open slots. So this just gives me a reference line of where to add glue or more accurately where not to add glue. And I'm using a straight edge clamp to the front of this jig and this gives me a consistent spot to place the leading edge of the strip cut to nine degrees. And then I just push that back into place until the bottom of that strip is flush with the bottom of the form. The original finger jointed chair this project is based on had a solid seat pan, but I felt like this was a part of the build where I could really add to the design. So I decided I wanted to add that same finger jointed detail from the curves to the seat pan. And disregard how I'm gluing up this finger jointed section of the seat pan because I realized later on it's much easier to glue this up piece by piece instead of pre-spacing the ingrained strips like you see me doing here. It worked okay, but wasn't necessary. This is definitely a case of me trying to get ahead of potential issues and in the process, I end up overthinking things and making even more work for myself. With that finger joint section in the clamps, I can work on the solid part of the seat pan and this will consist of milling and cutting that red oak board into five inch wide strips. After gluing these up in the next step, this gives me 10 inches of material on either side of the seat pan, and that seat pan needs to finish at 17 inches wide. For now, I'll set that aside to work on one of the main design details for this chair. So again, this chair is meant to go with that Kamiko table that I'm building for my wife, and I really wanted to carry over some of that Kamiko design to this chair. I want the Kamiko to live along the back radius of the chair, which means I have to make a Kamiko panel and then bend it into place. And I wouldn't even think that was possible, but I watched the video where my buddy Johnny Trambukas from JT Woodworks made a bent Kamiko lamp by kerf cutting the Kamiko panel before he bent it. This also means that I get to use a softer wood to make the Kamiko panel. Normally I use maple, which makes cutting those little angles on each strip a bit more difficult because maple is pretty hard. But this time I'm using basswood, which looks almost identical to maple, but is much, much softer, meaning cutting those angles will be much easier. I managed to find a few boards of basswood at my local Rockler store, but these were an inch and an eighth thick, so I resawed those down closer to five eighths of an inch and ran those through the planer to clean them up. And while I get set up to cut the Kamiko strips, I wanna talk a little bit more about why woodworkers hate building chairs. But again, don't just take it from me that chairs are the worst. I'll let Cam from Blacktail Studio explain. Chairs are very overrated in my opinion. I mean, look at the best woodworkers in the world. We can all agree they come from one place, right? Japan. And where is the preferred eating position in Japan? On the floor without a chair, just saying. So it's not that I don't have the skill to build a chair, it's that I don't possess the ability to build a chair, which I think is different. And while I would love to build a sitting height table for my family, I'm not sure these rusty old knees of mine could handle sitting cross-legged for an entire meal, so I'll just stick with building this chair. And it's not just the time-consuming nature and the low return on building chairs. Chairs are difficult. Now, granted, I'm making this way more complex by adding the bent wood, the finger joints, and all the other little design details, but even basic chairs require a level of difficulty that doesn't add up to what you can earn in return. The last time I made a Kamiko panel, I used a diagonal grid, and this leaves you with only two angles to cut to make the Asanoha pattern. Those angles are 30 and 60 degrees. Well, this time I need to make a square grid, and making a square grid is much easier, but then when you make the square grid, the angles that you need to cut to make the Asanoha pattern are a bit more tricky. You actually have three different angles that you have to cut, a 67.5 degree angle, a 45 degree angle, and a 22.5 degree angle. So I bought the appropriate jigs and one of the new sleds that can cut both square and diagonal grids from Johnny Trimbukas over at JT Woodworks. And Johnny is a Kamiko master and sells everything you need to get started. So make sure you check him out, but only after you watch this entire video. But anyways, I'm making a small Kamiko panel for the back of the chair. And since I'm using a softer wood, I'll cut all the strips for the Asanoha pattern using the Kamiko jigs and a chisel versus using the disc sander jig like my last Kamiko project. And it's super satisfying with how smooth the basswood cuts. And when you get all the angles and the length perfect, those pieces just pop right into the grid. Thank you. 
Making Kimiko is super relaxing, and if there was ever a bit of woodworking that you wanted to try without having to invest in a whole bunch of tools, Kimiko is the way to go. So I was almost done with this Kimiko panel, and I kept wondering, like, why are these angles? They just, they look off, um, and I couldn't figure it out. And then I did figure it out, and it's because I was cutting the wrong angle. <laughs> the angles are off because it's a different angle than I'm supposed to cut. Th this was the vast majority of uh, this Kamiko panel. So now I have to go back. I have to uh, cut 48 new uh, blanks and then go through and cut the angles. But it, it just, it looks really bad. There's just no way around it. I gotta, I gotta redo it. Now, screwing up this Kamiko panel has nothing to do with building chairs, but still with how time consuming building a chair is, it's no fun to waste a couple hours and materials. But luckily I enjoy the Kamiko making process. So I just popped in my earbuds and made 48 new pieces to fix my mistake. Oh, and by the way, I told you all in my last video, I was gonna be dropping a new t-shirt soon and you can sort of see me wearing it right here. This is the new Trust the Process tee. Honestly, it's my favorite design yet. So if you want to grab one for yourself, I've got a link down below for my merch as well as the Maker Tee and the Wing It Tee. And they're all designed by my favorite tattoo artist, Brandon Cutter here in Oklahoma City. And when you guys buy my merch, it goes a long way to support what I do. So I really appreciate that. But if you want to support what I do and not spend any money, the best way to do that is just to tap that subscribe button and stay tuned for more awesome projects that I've got planned throughout this year. Like I said, my next video will be that table build for my wife. We already started working on it and that table is gonna be killer. I can't wait to show y'all, I'm so excited. Okay, enough of that. I got the chair out of the fixturing jig that I built and the glue is dry and I can cut off those protruding strips of wood and see what those finger joints really look like. The chair is looking really good so far, but there is so much more to be done. And after a little sanding, I'm going to add the back legs. Now, this is a super important step, maybe the most important step, but I'll let Chris Salamone from Four Eyes Furniture explain. The problem is a human body has to fit in it. So if you're building a dresser and you build it 31 inches tall instead of 30 inches tall, nobody notices. But if you're building a chair and you make the seat, say 16 inches high instead of 17 inches, you're gonna feel like you're a little kid sitting at the grown-up table. Now the good news is I took all the guesswork out of it. I designed a couple beautiful chairs along with a bunch of other plans, all available at foreyesfurniture.com. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. Sorry the video got cut off there at the end. I have no idea what happened. And in order to get the legs cut accurately, I have to put the whole thing back into the fixturing jig as this is what I'm gonna to use to reference the angle and the placement of those back legs. And when I drew this up in my modeling software, I set those legs to 20 degrees, but that doesn't always transfer to the real world. But in this case, 20 degrees or something really close looks good. Now the angle doesn't have to be perfectly precise. I could end up at like 19.5 degrees or something else really close. But the important thing is that once I set my crosscut sled to that angle, I must leave it there in exactly that position to cut all the complementary angles. And I've done enough weird glue ups to know beforehand that this is gonna be a weird glue up. So my strategy here is to add dominoes to align the legs into the base of the seat. And then once those are all glued in, I'll use the fixturing jig itself to clamp everything in place. All right, so the next thing I need to do is figure out how to put this piece in the middle of the seat pan. So trying to describe this in accurately is not gonna be the easiest thing. What I'm gonna do is line it up right in the middle of these two pieces, and then I'll just trace the outline and then take it over the bandsaw, make that cut. But I think what I can do after that, I think I can just temporarily CA glue each side and then I can route that exact edge and then I'll have that cut out and then I can glue the whole thing back up and then cut out my seat pan. Okay, that's what I'm gonna do. If you listen to everything I just explained about how to cut the curve and glue up this piece, please immediately forget what you just heard because that is very much not how this works. 
And at this point, I'm just happily plugging along, thinking that I've got the seat pan all figured out. So I have a tendency to make things way harder than what they need to be. Or in this case, I just, I really, had an idea and didn't know how to execute it and just thought that I would figure out along the way, which is mostly what I do, but it's not working out on this one. I thought I could just, you know, you saw me scribe in that profile, cut it on the bandsaw, and then I'm like, oh, I can just come back and uh, flush trim it and use this as a template. Well, you can't do that because that's the opposite of what we're trying to carve here. So I threw it in the vise and tried to sand to my line. But the problem is, one, I was using the Rotex, which is really aggressive. And two, on this inch and a half edge, it's really hard to keep that square the whole time when you're sanding. So it has a tendency to kind of lean one way or the other. And it looks like crap. So what I did was I went into my modeling software. I drew a model that is as close to the dimensions of this as I could possibly get. We're gonna take this out to the CNC, carve it to those dimensions, and then we'll see if it works, but there's no guarantee that it's going to. So once again, chairs suck. I hate building chairs. Man, Johnny, you are really undertaking a difficult task. Chairs are tough. Uh, you have a lot of compound angles, especially in the legs. It makes it difficult to set up systems for making just a few pieces. Uh, I really like to create machines that are capable of, of doing things over and over. And when you're only making a few chairs, it's just really tough to do. So good luck, my friend. Thanks, Jonathan. Always nice to get some encouragement from one of the best guys I know. So now my thinking is just make a model of that profile and then cut a new edge on those blocks for the seat pan and just kind of hope it all lines up. This ended up better, but it's still way off. So now it's on to plan C. And this time I'll try gluing up the seat pan with those curved finger joint strips all at one time. Oh, that made that way better. I'm borrowing a technique here that I saw from another YouTube woodworker, Johnny Builds from five minutes ago. And I'll use that dry fit method to mark where I should and shouldn't apply glue. He was able to avoid getting glue down in the gaps and I'm hoping for the same results here. So thanks Johnny, I'm a huge fan. With the seat pan all glued up, now I have to install it, which is not as easy as it seems. And the main reason for that is where the seat pan interacts with the inward curves of the finger joint glue ups. This isn't something I can just 3D model beforehand and know the exact dimensions. I mean, you can get close, but you end up with a more organic shape after the glue ups that isn't perfectly symmetrical. Holy shit, that worked. So the best solution I can come up with is to make a template by scribing in the exact radius on this quarter inch piece of plywood scrap. Now it fits along this radius and I can trace the exact dimensions that I need. Then I take those measurements along every inch and import those into my 3D modeling software. And using the fit point spline tool, I connect the dots and then use this to make the G code that I'm gonna use to cut this out on the CNC. I know this seems like a lot of extra work, and if you have a better method, I'm all ears. After carving a test piece out of plywood, I can see that I'm really close. Close enough, I can go ahead and carve the actual seat pan on the CNC. I marked out where the front edge of the seat pan sits in reference to the front legs, and then using a scrap of red oak strip, I scribed in a little radius on the front of the seat pan. Now, I always throw a little title at the end of the video to see who watches the whole thing, but recently I figured out that some of you were just jumping right to the end, so I'm hiding the secret word right here. Comment sit down if you watch this far into the video, and again, thank you for watching this video and supporting what I do. All right, I've got the C-Pan glued up and in place. Again, it's not perfect. It's a little gappy on the right side, but it's close enough and I've got plenty of surface contact for a really strong glue joint. And I'll just come back later and fill that gap with some wood strips. All right, getting back to the Kamiko, I can attempt that curve bending. And I've got some reservations on this working and how it's gonna look, but I spent all that time making the Kamiko panel, so it's just full steam ahead. These are called curve cuts, where you essentially cut most of the way through the piece without actually cutting all the way. And this gives the panel the ability to bend to a certain degree. Okay, while those curve cuts worked, I mean, I can bend it pretty close to the radius that I need. It did 
tear this out pretty bad. Um, this is damaged and I would have to make an entirely new panel. But I think I'm gonna have the same issue. So plan B are these dowels. I'm going to make a template. I'm gonna drill some holes. I'm gonna put the dowels through along the back. And then these are also going to echo all the little places that I was gonna add dowels for extra strength on the rest of the chair. So I think this is gonna really work. I'm bummed about the Kamiko, man, because this was a cool process. And like I said, like, <laughs> it sounds terrible, but it bends pretty dang well. It's just not the right move on this chair. So let's get these dowels installed instead. And you're probably thinking, well, Johnny, it looks like you plan to use dowels all along and you wouldn't be <laughs> completely wrong. I truly hope the Kamiko panel would work, but the whole time I had serious reservations that it actually would. So I had this plan B in my back pocket from the get go. And I've screwed up enough furniture at this point that I try to pre-plan my mistakes. I know I'm gonna screw something up, so it's nice if I've already thought of a solution beforehand. After getting the lower hole locations marked, I realized that I had a problem. Even with a 90 degree drill attachment, the 3 8 inch Forstner bit that I'm using is too long to get in between the curves. So off camera, I modified this by grinding off about three quarters of an inch in length. And now it just barely fits enough that I can drill these holes. So I'm in the home stretch now wrapping up this chair. I only have about a hundred more tiny steps to go. And while I work on all those, I want to reflect on this chair build and talk more about why woodworkers hate building chairs. And honestly, hate is the wrong word. Chairs are just kind of annoying. I've enjoyed the challenges of building this chair and since it's for my wife and I can make this video about the process, it's okay that it's taken me a lot of time to build just one chair. Now, if I was gonna sell this chair, I'd likely price it at 2000 bucks. And if you think that's ridiculous, well, you wouldn't be wrong. I personally feel given the number of hours that I put into it and the complexity of the build, 2000 is the right number. But at the same time, no one is going to pay that price for this chair. Or maybe there is someone out there who would, but those customers are few and far between and they definitely don't exist here in Oklahoma City. And if you look at it from purely a YouTube woodworker perspective, all those same reasons likely lend to the fact that you don't see a lot of chair builds on here. Out of my 120 videos that I've done, this is my fourth video dedicated to building a chair and none of the previous videos have really performed all that well. I have no clue how this one will perform because my thoughts are chair builds just aren't as compelling of a narrative as a large dining table. And let's say I would have titled this video finger joint chair build. Would you have clicked on it? Maybe, but chances are most folks would skip it and that's fine. I never want to build projects because I think the algorithm is going to like it. I want to build projects that get me excited and challenge my skills. And this build certainly did both for me. So yes, while I do hate building chairs, I kind of love this project. All right, I've got one final design detail to add to this chair. I still need to add lower stretchers to ensure that the legs are sturdy. So I decided to add that same curved finger jointed detail from the seat pan on the front to back runner that connects the stretchers. I had to make a new one that fits the distance, but I figured after watching me build these things twice, you don't need to see me do it for a third time. And I'm gonna cheat a little bit on the construction by using screws to put this together since this will save me a day of waiting for that glue to dry. And I can get this installed in the lower section of the legs right away using a few two and a half inch blocks to set the height. I'm just gonna glue this in place given that it's gonna be sturdy enough using just the glue. And with how narrow that runner is, I don't wanna risk cracking it by adding in a screw or worse yet, if I get the angle off, I could puncture through the surface. Earlier, I mentioned that the fitment of the seat pan was a little gappy and using this thin scrap, I'll hide that gap. Like I said, there's plenty of glue surface between the seat pan and the lower curve that this is gonna be strong enough. And you saw me add dowel pegs to further strengthen the glue joints and those finger joints between the front legs and the curves. All that's left now is to give the whole thing a good sanding. And I did have to make this little popsicle stick sanding block to get in between the slats where I did have a little bit of glue squeeze out. Not a ton, but enough that I wanted to make sure I got it all cleaned up. After sanding the whole chair to 180 grit, I sprayed the chair down with water to pop the grain before the final sanding. Last, to finish this chair, I'm using Total Boat Wood Honey, which is one of my favorite finishes to use, while also being pretty much the easiest finish to use. You just wipe it on, buff it off, and it looks awesome. And to get down in between the slats, I just used a chip brush, and with that, this chair is finished. 
I think it looks amazing, but let's go see what Katie thinks. Okay, Katie, come on in here and check it out. This is your... Oh, wow. That is gorgeous. You like it? Oh my gosh, I <laughs> love that. What happened to the Kamiko? <sighs> Well, <laughs> we had a little bit of an issue, but the Kamiko is currently in the trash can. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is beautiful. This is great. All right, ready to try it out? And... Ready. Okay. Let's do this. Give it a go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah? Nice. Is yeah. it comfy? Yeah. Don't lie. <laughs> <laughs> So definitely not the most comfortable chair, but also not the most uncomfortable chair. But I do think it'll probably be a long time before I build a chair again, but I'm really glad that I took on this project. I think I was able to take that Sam Wong Lee design and turn it into my own thing. And yeah, I'm not making any money on this, but the wife seems to like it and making her happy is the only currency that I need. That in actual currency. And real quick before I go, I know I'm gonna get a ton of comments saying, you know, there's no way to clean down in between these slats. And you know what? You guys are right. I mean, it's just completely impossible. 